Debbie, that is awesome. Uh, we have a wonderful message this morning, and I think you're going to enjoy it because I'm going to teach you what a batches of Kafir means, which is often most misinterpreted. And as long as you believe is misinterpretation, you will never be able to have faith for healing. Okay. So, oh, by the way, I want to give you a very support. I started walking in a park. Normally I walk, uh, when it started, I walk uh, 50 meters, 50, every size. Actually, I walk uh, 600 meters. And the first four for 30 meters non stop. we speak on divine healing and God's will and heart to heal people, someone will bring up Paul's thorn in the flesh. They say, it must not be God's will to heal people always. God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh. He made him sick. Paul tried to believe the Lord for healing, but wasn't healed. Since Paul was such a great man of God and the Lord didn't heal him, who are we to think that God will heal us? This misconception is based on a misinterpretation of a passage of scripture. Furthermore, actually, I'm going to show you that one God gave Paul a thorn of flesh. Number one. Number two, it was not a sickness. As long as you believe those two things, Often people say, Paul was healed. He asked God, I can I believe this God's will to heal me? Not to understand the message today. Uh, oh, by the way, I hope you, you enjoy Papa Bible teaching. Hope you do. Because 
to the our facing and season. Amen. Amen. The, the Bible does not say that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness. You can listen to people who argue that, but it's not what the word really says. Let's read 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. In verse 7, Paul made it very clear that this thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. The Greek word translated messenger here is also rendered angel elsewhere in the New Testament. Therefore, this was a demonic messenger, a dark angel sent from the devil to buffet Paul. Paul's thorn in the flesh, was it from God or from the devil? There are two different views regarding this. Paul's thorn, that's view number one, is Paul's thorn in the flesh was given by God. Now some people believe that God gave this thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to Paul to keep him from being exalted above measure. They just automatically think that this is saying the thorn in the flesh was sent from God to keep him humble. Widespread teaching that God is the author of disease and that He has chosen some of the most devout of His children to remain sick and glorify Him by exhibiting fortitude and patience. This has no doubt led to the idea that Paul had a sickness that God refused to heal. I would like to quote the following from a sermon preached by a prominent preacher. Among other things, he said, The fact is, Paul was sick. He was the sickest of men. He had one of the worst and painful of diseases. He had ophthalmia, a disease of the eyes. The proof that he had it is overwhelming. He tells us that he had a thorn in the flesh. When Paul stood before Christian, his eyes filled with unspeakable pus, unspeakable looking matter running down over his face. Why would they have gorged out their eyes for him, except that his eyes, as he stood before them, were a pitiable and appealing sight to them, as the eyes of anyone with ophthalmia are? The particular pain of this disease is that it is like a stake in the eyes. It is beyond dispute that Paul was a sick man. He says so himself. Paul did not get this disease by infection. How did he get it? Jesus Christ gave it to him. Paul did not want to be sick. He prayed the Lord to heal him from the sickness. He prayed not once, not twice, but three times. He received no answer to his prayers. Paul, Paul, Paul. By the way, this is not the purpose of Jesus then gave sickness. And the son is a healer. People within this room uh, and by one cross nation. How would God give disease? Does it count for the fall, infection, germs and demons? Actions when God never does disease on people. But people often say 
if it's sick and it feels and I hear that, or maybe you're the fall, you have a thorn, a flesh, horrible teaching. That's horrible teaching, not a bad thing. In spite of all his brain, he got no healing. His thrice offered prayer brought him no cure, not even the hint of healing. That is not all. The Lord said to Paul a very startling thing. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. He tells Paul it is better for him to be sick than to be well. He tells Paul that it is divine will, he shall not be cured. He tells Paul that divine power can and will operate in and through him better with ophthalmia and sickness than without it. Hear what Paul has to say in response to the Lord concerning his infirmity and the will of the Lord that he shall not be cured of him. These are his words. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here is Paul saying just this. I will glory in my ophthalmia. My eyes may be full of repulsive discharges. I may be the object of pity. No matter, I will glory in it. I will rejoice in my sickness. Uh, that's the view of one preacher. That's not the Bible. It's the out of context. But people actually believe that. They think God put disease, God put cancer, God put tumors to humble people, to teach people. They are one us the hostile. When his father would put disease on his child, impossible to teach them. The world teaches, I don't need disease. This view raises some serious questions. It makes God indirectly responsible for initiating evil attacks and being the author of disease in Paul's life. But this contradicts many other clear scriptures about God's character. James 1 verse 13 tells us, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. James 1 verse 17 tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Pause a moment. We saw last week. This is what's called what captivity. This is what was called the mod of passion. I'm not a perfect gift. Don't have a thing like that. As long as you think there's some sickness, God wants you to have, you want to have faith, faith. John chapter 10 verse 10 it tells us that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Paul's thorn in the flesh, now was it from the devil? In this view, which is much more plausible, Paul's thorn in the flesh was from the devil. In this view, which is much more plausible, Paul's thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, was given by the devil himself to try and hinder Paul's ministry. It was not God trying to humble Paul. Humility is important, but there's also a godly type of exaltation that is mentioned many times in both the Old and the New Testament scriptures. One example is 1 Peter 5 verse 6, which says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. At the moment, you know, when you humble yourself before God, as God does the exaltation for most people. And the devil does like it. 
Paul was being exalted beyond measure and Satan hated. When, when Pastor Simmons was being promoted, every attack, every demon came against his ministry. So there is a godly time of promotion which comes from God. Being exalted, being lifted up, is good when God does it. However, some people assume that Paul was speaking about pride in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. They argue Paul had a real problem with pride and arrogance, so God gave him this thorn in the flesh to break him and keep him humble. That's not a biblical principle. The Bible says to humble yourself. If God does it to you, that's not humility, it's humiliation. Humility is not something you can force on a person. It has to come from the inside out. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 is talking about Paul being exalted or promoted everywhere he went. He saw people raised from the dead, demons cast out, and many other miracles. The people in one city where he ministered exclaimed, those that have turned the world upside down have come here also. There was much power and anointing in Paul's life and ministry. His ministry was drawing many people to the Lord. Satan recognized that Paul was drawing many people to the Lord because he was walking in such absolute victory and being exalted by God. The devil wanted to humiliate and shame Paul and do something to keep him from being exalted and promoted beyond measure. That's what 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 is talking about. Lest Paul be exalted above measure, Satan gave him a thorn in the flesh. It was from the devil. Not God. Promote and the word was given a form of first actually means it was it was it was assigned, assigned. No a gift from God. It never says who gave it. It never says it was given. It was given or assigned. I believe uh, yeah, Satan assign a team to him the ball and not to a, to a first sickness but to him the work. Paul's thorn in the flesh was not sickness. Paul's thorn in the flesh was not sickness. It was a demonic messenger sent from Satan to buffet him. One reason some people think it was sickness is because the word infirmities is used twice in this passage. Verse 9 and 10 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The word infirmity is used nearly universally nowadays to refer to some type of a sickness. People say, this person has an infirmity. We even call the place where we send sick people the infirmary. Although it, although it has an almost exclusive connotation with sickness in its popular use today, the meaning of the word infirmity wasn't limited to sickness at the time that the King James Bible was written. Take for example Romans 8.26 Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Notice the colon after the word infirmities and again after the word ought. This verse is saying that it is an infirmity not to know what we should pray for as we ought. If you were to look up the word infirmity in the dictionary, you'd find that it not only means a sickness, 
It could also be any weakness of inadequacy. This is how it was used in Romans 8.26 in another translation. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit helps him, uh, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Not knowing how to pray for something is a weakness, an inadequacy, an infirmity, not a sickness or a disease. Some people just assume that Paul was talking about sickness here in 2 Corinthians when he said, I glory in my infirmities. But as we look at the context, we'll see that it wasn't sickness. We must remember that man put in the, ch in the chapter and verse, we must remember that man put in the chapter and verse divisions later for the purpose of reference. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to remember that the book we call 2 Corinthians was all one letter. It wasn't broken up by chapter and verse divisions. In what we call 2 Corinthians 11, Paul talked about his infirmities. He said, if I must glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Starting in verse 23, Paul defined, explained and listed what he was calling infirmities. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, labors more abundant. As this list continues, keeping in mind that these are all the things that just a few verses later, Paul summarized by saying, I'm going to glory in these infirmities. He called labors more abundant, hard work and infirmity. It caused weakness, stress and problems in his life. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often, of the Jews five times received by forty stripes, say one. Five times Paul was whipped with thirty-nine stripes. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Three times he was cruelly beaten with an instrument similar to a metal rod. This was often done on the feet, resulting in broken bones. Once was I stoned. This happened in Acts 14 verse 19, where I personally believed he died. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Who caused all these hardships for Paul? Who caused people to rob him? Who caused people to uh, turn him? Who caused a demon? A demon assigned to hinder Paul's ministry. And the, the demon caused people to persecute him. Why? So he will not, not be promoted beyond measure in his ministry. Because Paul had been given so much revelation, he wrote so much of the New Testament. We can't say I was torn in flesh. Some people said that they're living the sin living we we lives as one thorn of us, I was thorn of us, but that have you written have you written the new testament? <laughs> you are so important. In weariness and painfulness in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which come upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. I must needs glory. I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. All of these things listed were talking about persecution and hardships that Paul endured for the cause of Christ. Then just a few verses later, he declared 
Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. In context, infirmities here is talking about all about the hardships he suffered for the gospel. It's a wrong assumption to just take the word infirmity and assume that it refers to sickness, when in context of other verses, Paul made it very clear that it didn't. Romans 8 verse 26 used the same word, infirmities, to refer to lack of knowledge or understanding about how to pray. So we have established that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a messenger from Satan. It was not a sickness. Many people jump to the conclusion of sickness because of this word infirmity. Yet in context it was used in a different way here to describe the persecutions and hardships Paul suffered because of the gospel. In verse 10 goes on to make it very clear, saying, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Although some people assume the word infirmities here means physical sickness, the other four things listed in this verse and the context of 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 33, immediately before this, before this reveal other bias. The other four things listed in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10 are reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses. Every one of these make it clear that this is not talking about some kind of physical sickness. Rather, it was speaking of a hardship or persecution that Paul had to deal with. Reproaches were insults, injuries, harms, and hurts. Necessities referred to doing without certain things for the gospel. And persecution and distresses are easily understood. All of these are consistent with the context of this passage. If Paul was using this, this word infirmity to mean physical sickness, it would be inconsistent with the other things he listed here. Infirmities here is referring to the hardships he suffered for the cause of the Lord. The Old Testament imagery. Furthermore, the people with a Jewish background in the church that Paul was writing to would recognize the phrase thorn in the flesh from the early books of the Old Testament. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as bricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land in which you live. Numbers 33 and 55. Moses told the Israelites that if they do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before them, then these heathen people would persecute and corrupt them. They would be stained and tainted through these pagan people if they let them live. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your side, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Well, well, every instance of the word thorn in the flesh in the Old Testament was referring to people, people, not sinners, to people. Okay. So, the thorn in the flesh was what uh, a sinner, no, a messenger of Satan who caused persecution. The Israelites hadn't obeyed God, so the Lord said, All right, the prophecy that Moses gave in Numbers 33:55 is going to come to pass. Once again, he referred to people as being scourges in their sides or thorns in their eyes. Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. When Paul used the terminology thorn in the flesh, 
their minds immediately went back to the imagery in the Old Testament scriptures of Numbers 33.55, Joshua 23.13, and Judges 2 verse 3. In each case, it referred to people who were antagonistic towards God's people. This is further biblical evidence that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a demonic personality, a dark angel, a messenger from Satan that stirred up persecutions everywhere Paul went. He made reference to this in 1 Corinthians 4, saying in essence, we apostles suffer more than anybody else. The people we minister to are esteemed and blessed, but we are despised and considered the scourges of the earth. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 9-13. For I think God has exhibited us, apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. And we toil working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to reconcil reconciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. In other words, Paul was talking about the hardships and persecutions that he endured. It's apparent in the word that this demonic messenger worked hard to influence people to persecute Paul wherever he went. Paul walked in victory, but he also endured more persecution, shipwrecks, beatings, imprisonments, rejection and criticism than anyone else. Satan used this opposition against him. Even though the power of God was manifest in Paul's life, it was not without a price. Well, I remember I was reading this, I thought, oh, Pastor Seamus. I was listening to his messages of the day. What an anointing, what a patient, what a barbarian. We will not have the ministry of the world for him. But he paid a price. A price most people do not want. Sanded, cold cases, lost property, land of water. Why? All because he had, a, he had a mission. Don't ever think that a man of God can be persecuted. If he's being persecuted, maybe there may be nothing wrong with them. There may be that everything advised was. This made other people think twice. They may have even reasoned in their hearts. What he's saying is true, but I'm not sure I'd like to suffer the way he suffered in order to be, in order to be able to walk in it. The devil was doing this to turn people away from Paul's message. My grace is sufficient. So Paul sought the Lord three times to remove this thorn in the flesh this demonic angel that stirred up persecution through people. As we saw in the Old Testament, that's what a thorn in the flesh is, persecution through people. Paul asked Jesus three times to remove it, and the Lord answered, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Though Christ's finished work, through Christ's finished work on the cross, we have been redeemed from sickness. He carried away our disease, but not from persecution. On the cross, it says in Isaiah 53, verse 24, who has believed, I have walked 
was the arm of the Lord between two, for he carried away a disease and bore pain, and he was a place for our sins, crushed and created, and by his flesh we be healed. It is the faith for sins and sinners on the cross. But not for persecution. He said, in this world you have much tribulation. Paul himself acknowledged this truth later in his life while writing to Timothy, Yea, and all that who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <coughs> Perhaps Paul didn't understand this yet when he asked God to take this thorn in the flesh away. He was pressing in as hard as he could to receive all that the Lord had for him. He was even trying to get free from and stop the persecution. Finally, the Lord told him, Paul, you aren't redeemed from persecution, but I'll give you my grace to deal with it. Just think, if God had freed us from all persecution and he stopped all of our persecutors, there never would have been an Apostle Paul. Paul himself had been a persecutor. Paul was there participating in the stoning death of Stephen. If God would have just wiped out all of the persecutors, there never would have been an Apostle Paul. God doesn't stop all of our persecutors. Rather, he reveals himself to people through us as we continue to love them, forgive them, turn the other cheek, and follow Jesus. It is a powerful testimony when we continue to love God despite their threats, and God uses it. We aren't redeemed from persecution, but we are redeemed from sickness. Eye problems. People who teach that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness often misinterprets Galatians chapter 4. They theorize that he had some kind of eye disease that caused runny, puffy eyes and gave him constant eye problems. They attempt to verify this with a passage in this chapter. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness, KJV, infirmity of the flesh, that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. <coughs> infirmity of the flesh. Notice the terminology in this verse, infirmity of the flesh, in verse 13. This wasn't just an infirmity, it was an infirmity of the flesh. Paul wasn't talking about a lack of understanding, as in not knowing how to pray in Romans 8.26, or a hardship that he endured like shipwrecks and perils mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11. This is literally talking about some kind of physical problem. Since he used the terminology, infirmity of the flesh, he qualified it. He basically used the same terminology again in verse 14 of Galatians 4. Some people look at this and argue, Paul said right here that he did have an infirmity. Yes, he did mention a problem here, but notice what he said in verse 13. You know how through infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you at the first. At the first implies that it wasn't something long term that God wouldn't heal him off. It was something temporary. Paul went on to say, where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Some people say, look, now Paul's talking about an eye problem. That's his infirmity of the flesh. So they theorized that this was an ancient aromic disease of runny, puffy eyes that lasted throughout Paul's entire life. 
If you can speculate that, then you can make the Bible say anything you want. This is a flimsy basis of interpretation. Left for dead. Let's consider a much more accurate and plausible interpretation. In order to do so, we need to look at Acts chapter 14. Paul was preaching in Lystra and Derby. For a while, the people there thought he was God. And when the people saw that Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in speech of like Cornea, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas, Jupiter, and Paul, Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Paul and Barnabas restrained the people from offering a sacrifice and worshipping them. However, the very next day, those same people became mad at them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. This was the instance when Paul was stoned and left for dead. He referred to this in 2 Corinthians 11. Once was I stoned. Personally, I believe he was dead. He wasn't dead. If, you know, if he wasn't dead, he was so close to it that the people who were trying to kill him supposed that he had been dead. Whether he was dead or very close to it, the word says that as the disciples stood around him, he rose up and came into the city. The next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby, 20 to 50 miles away. Paul walked and or rode to the next town, and the next day preached them to the people there. Can you guess where the cities Iconium, Lystra, and Derby were located? They were all part of a region called Galatia. These are the people Paul was writing to in Galatians chapter 4 when he said, At first you took pity on me because of this infirmity in my flesh. You would have plucked out your own eyes for me. Instead of pulling out of the clear blue sky that Paul had some kind of ancient eye disease, it's much more honest with scripture to recognize that Galatians 4 is referring to the exact same time period when Paul had been stoned, left for dead, rose up, traveled over 20 miles the next day, and began preaching to the people in the next city. Since Paul went from being stoned to death to preaching in the next city in less than 24 hours, it is so inconceivable that his eyes might have been hurting him due to the rocks that had repeatedly struck his head the day before. If Paul was talking about the fact that he had some damage to his eyes from stoning the day before, it was only temporary. Paul said it was only at the first that this infirmity of the flesh bothered him. Although it's obvious that God's miraculous healing power was at work in his body, it probably took some time to fully mend. It was something temporary in his body that healed him over time. Paul got over it. It's also possible that when Paul said, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me, he was using a figure of speech. People say, you'd give your right arm for me. Does that mean they have bad right arms? No, it's just a figure of speech. People used to say this person would sacrifice anything for me. So Paul saying you would have plucked out your own eye and given it to me may not have had anything to do with him having anything wrong with his eyes. The people who contend that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness in the form of some eye disease go on to Galatians chapter 6. You see how large a letter I have written on unto you with mine, my own hand? I actually heard someone use this verse to argue that Paul was so nearly blind because of his eyesight problem that his handwriting was three or four inches tall. <laughs> they, say, they said he had to write huge letters to be able to communicate. If that were true and Paul was referring to large size letters, can you imagine how big this letter to the Galatians had to have been? It would have been volumes and volumes. Nobody could have carried it. He would have only one or two words on a page. 
Just count how many words there are in Galatians. That's not what Paul was talking about here. There are different words for talking about size or quantity in the Greek language. The word translated large in Galatians 6 verse 11 is the only one for quantity. Paul wasn't talking about how big and tall each individual letter of each word was. He was saying, this letter, this piece of correspondence that I've written you has become so long. In my Bible, Paul's letter to the Galatians takes up four pages of small print. If you were to print Galatians out in 12-point type Times New Roman font, double-spaced on a regular sheet of 8.5 by 11 paper size, it would be more than eight pages long. I would consider that a large letter in the sense that it's long. Most personal notes are only a page long or less. The people who argue that Paul was saying that every individual letter of each word he wrote was so big are straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. People who use these scriptures to say that Paul had an eye disease are breaking every rule of sound biblical interpretation. They're just talking some reference and interpreting any way they want. If Paul did have an eye problem, referred to in Galatians 4, it was because he was stoned and left for dead the day before, and it was only temporary. That would be the only correlation between what Paul was saying in Galatians chapter 4 and his mentioning of thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. Paul's thorn in the flesh was not some type of sickness. It was a demonic messenger sent from Satan to stir up persecution wherever he went. If the statement, my grace is sufficient for you, meant that God was telling Paul to keep his sickness, it would be the only case in the Bible where God told a person he wanted them to remain sick, that he would give them grace for a physically sick body. Nowhere do scriptures state that God gives grace to the physical body. The word grace indicates that it was the inner person that needed help. The grace of God is important only to the inner person, which Paul says in his case was renewed day by day. God's grace is for the spiritual person, but the life of Jesus is manifested in our mortal flesh. Uh, uh. I think that's a great time. Do you understand that? Did you understand that? Yes. For years and years, I believe too. I do believe God gave poor the thorn, the flesh. But now I understand the truth. He called Jesus for me. He will be the initiator of evil attacks on the world, apostle. He will be here. And to see the purpose thing is, if you say that, then how can you really God with you? But Jesus never said, general sake. My guess is sufficient. He says it for those past beauty, those enduring hardship, for those seeking healing, he says, I will, I will, I will. There are, there are other reasons why some healing are delayed, which I would teach you. Well, in the future, but understand, as long as I believe that God is responsible for my cancer, my tumor, my headaches, my angina, whatever, you will never have faith for him. How can you have faith for something you know, sure is God's will. Faith begins where God's will is wrong. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> I've had so many pictures, even uh, in our churches, these the pastors to me, oh God, I love this disease. And I said, you have so much patience on this. And the man said, please refer to Pastor Yard's message on February 28th. And we understand what was on the first was, but you are also Thank you.